Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel, how real-time payments will change the bill payments landscape. Thank you again to our audience today for spending some of your valuable time with us. I'm David Albertazzi, Research Director for IT Group's Retail Banking and Payments Practice, and I will be mod moderating this panel of industry experts on bill payments. What an exciting time, and really challenging at the same time, uh, it is to be part of the payments industry. There's so many changes taking place. Um, consumer demands and expectations continue to evolve and the use of technology and digital tools in our personal day-to-day -day lives have now raised the bar for consumer expectations, including as it relates to bill payments. Uh, before I set the stage for our discussion, let me introduce our panelists. We are joined by Sue Whitney from Central One, Manal Tukan from MasterCard, Mark DiFilippo from TELUS, Andrew Oliom from Payments Canada, and Lalka from TD Bank. Welcome everyone. I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, your roles, as well as your organization. Let me start with you, Sue. Sure, David, thank you. Uh, my name is Sue Whitney. I'm Vice President of Payment Strategy and Relationships for Central One. Uh, we represent several hundred credit unions and provide payment services to them across the board for retail and commercial payments. Great. Thanks, Sue. Manal? Great. Thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Manal Tukan, and I'm responsible for uh, heading up bill payments uh, for MasterCard uh, for our North America region. Uh, most recently, our team's been responsible for deploying a new real-time uh, bill pay application known as Bill Pay Exchange. Uh, Mark. Hi, everyone. My name is Marty Filippo. I head up product and strategy for a division within TELUS called TELUS Financial Solutions. Uh, our group, we move data and payment for our key stakeholders, which are financial institutions, their clients. Uh, we move data and payment securely through different groups. And uh, in terms of bill payments outside of the financial institutions, we're probably the largest bill payment provider uh, in Canada. And we're offering this to over 16, 17 financial institutions and growing. So excited to be here. Great. Um, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here today virtually and be part of such an important discussion on bill payments. I'm Andrew Holyom. I'm the senior director of payment products at Payments Canada. And in my role, I'm ultimately responsible for business operations of our national payment systems, both retail and wholesale, or the ACSS and LBTS, respectively. And last but not least, uh, Vipul. Hey guys, Vipul Lalka from TD Bank, one of the largest banks in North America. And in my role, I'm responsible for enterprise payments, executing projects across retail, commercial, wholesale, so bill payments, real-time payments, all that is part of my ecosystem, as well as responsible for innovation around the payments and the digital space. So happy to be here and look forward to a great discussion. Thanks, everyone. So let me level set with our audience uh, with a few uh, data points specific to the Canadian bill, bill payment market. Um, Canada is one of the world is as one of the world's uh, lar highest, actually, I should say, online and mobile banking population. Right. This is also reflected with bill payments in Canada, with a relatively high proportion of bills um, today being paid online. To illustrate that, um, IT Group recently conducted a survey in Q4 of 2020 among a little bit over 1,500 Canadian consumers. Uh, you know, participants in the research indicated that they are involved in paying most of all of the bills uh, in their households profile of the sample was in proportion of uh, to the Canadian population for age, gender, income, geographic region, and race. Uh, in addition, population data from the Canadian Census Bureau was used to calculate projections for the total Canadian bill payment market, right? So um, uh, let's start with the fact that Canadians pay 1.6 billion bills annually shelling out roughly $535 billion. 68% of these bills are paid online and 32% are paid offline using other channels, right? Such as mail, in person or on the phone with an agent. And bank bill pay is the preferred model for online payments in Canada. And that is in contracts, for example, with the US uh, where Bill Direct dominates the, the market. So, 
we've seen some changes over the years in Canadian bill pay, especially as the mobile channels has been embraced by Canadians and the bill pay experience has been retrofitted to specifically to the mobile channel. Um, if you look on the, on the right side of the screen, in terms of the methods of payments, ACH dominates the uh, bill payment market, accounting for about 43% of the Canadian bill payment volume, right? But we have not noticed that a broadening of acceptance uh, methods is taking place over the years, right? So you see that 24% of payments are made via PADS, pre-authorized debits, 15% via credit cards, 4% via debit cards, 4% via checks, and 2% using cash, right? So as Canada is going through a major modernization in, of its payments infrastructure, it will bring significant further change to the daily lives of Canadians, right? And, and, and frankly, this has the potential to further transform the bill payments uh, ecosystem and experience in Canada, right? So kind of with that backdrop in mind, let me turn out, let me turn over now to our expert panel, right? Uh, with the first question. And let me start with you, Sue. What, what do you think are some of the things that have been working well in Canada so far with respect to bill payments? Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of good things about bill payment. Your data really conveys that, that, um, once a bill payment arrangement has been established, most consumers set and forget, right? They establish the path for how they wanna be able to go into online banking, push a couple buttons, be reassured that the money is gonna be sent to the biller and it mostly gets there and it's, uh, and it's seamless. And so once you've established that path, um, I think Canadians have the luxury of forgetting. Uh, a lot of that and simply have a little reminder, uh, maybe in their online banking or on their own calendars that says, uh, don't forget to pay your visa bill today or whatever. Um, the issue of course for them is if things don't get set up well or if things go wrong. And also I think what you're seeing is by the diversity, the enhanced diversity of the payment types is that our population's changing and biller needs are changing and consumers want to have choices um, around how they pay their bills, uh, increasingly diverse, um, obviously moving away from checks, but the, the online channel for paying your bills, it does work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great too. Um, Mark, what about from you, your, your point of view? I echo so a lot of what Sue says. The system, again, as is, does work well. You know, once you're set up, uh, and I look at, you know, the different parties there. You do have the Canadians who are using it. You have the billers. You have the billers and their ability to receive their funds and the remittance files. So, again, the model as set up works well, but I think we're all going to be agreeing in the most of the conversation is there's certainly areas of improvement for all stakeholders as well. The actual individual Canadians, um, the billers, how they receive their funds and how they receive their data, which I think uh, as new technologies, which we're going to explore, can allow for an improvement. But uh, it's a stable system. It works. And I think your numbers kind of show that. Canadians trust it. They trust their financial institution or the point of engagement of payments. So mm -hmm. overall, um, a solid system that works well with lots of areas for improvement, I'd say. A good foundation. That's great. That's great. And Andrew, you, you kind of sit in a unique position here, right? So we'd love to to hear uh, your comments as well. Thanks, David. Really, two things that I'd highlight, and I echo a lot of what both Sue and Mark Mark have said. That you know, first, that Canadians they've really embraced bill payments, and over the last twenty years, Canada has seen a growth and adoption and use of them. So that most profound growth took place between two thousand and, and two thousand and seven where we saw an annual growth rate of just shy of 14% year over year. And in that time frame, electronic bill payments contributed to that growth significantly, about 27% annual growth. Now that growth has leveled off somewhat. We're seeing about just less than 1% uh, percent now, uh, but nevertheless, that Canadians are really leveraging bill payments and they're part of our everyday lives. The other piece that for me that I think is working well, it really stems back to the rules framework, certainly something that's important and near to 
and dear to our heart at Payments Canada, specifically around H6, Rule H6 that was introduced back in, in 1996, you know, put in place to govern bill payment remittance processing, uh, where remittances are exchanged as credit transfers between financial institutions. But for me, it's about the three key principles which really speak to the intent of that rule. First being operational efficiency. So putting that rule in place, including the establishment of the CCIN or the corporate creditor institution number, uh, how that CCIN is used really to make sure that those remittances uh, move as they need to. Second principle around universality, that the rule facilitates universality for all parties in the remittance process so that customers can pay bills for any billers at that customer's financial institution, regardless of whether or not it's of the same biller. And then I think the last for me is the intent around uh, payment certainty and convenience. Customers are able to consider that payment completed once it's made as the payee's financial institution credits the payee on the day of the exchange. And, and the rules specify that specifically. So for me, it's that rules framework and the adoption that we've seen. Great, and uh, what about you, Vipul? Uh, mostly I echo everything. So without repeating it, if I look at what the pros are, uh, from a customer perspective, it's the customers who want control. So this allows for a system where I decide when I want to make the payment. It's not like a pre-authorized debit or it just gets debited from my account. So that's one of the uh, things I would add on that wasn't covered. Uh, from a merchant perspective, there are lots of improvement areas, but then it's been going on for so many years that it's taken care of. Like as a merchant, if I want to be on the billing system, I tell my bank that I'm with and it does work right now. I have a lot more to say on the improvement side, but again, it works on both sides. And the last thing I would say is from a convenience perspective, again, both sides, you can schedule bill payments. And because it's not real time, you can actually cancel them on same day. And then there is an established process if you want to uh, deny some charges or if you want to dispute something. So we have processes established across all the participants in the industry FIs, the customers, they know what to do. The call centers know what to do. And then the merchants, they know what to do as well. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, That's great. So sounds almost perfect, right? Um, <laughs> so now tell us from, uh, from your perspective, right? Has there been any friction in the overall experience, either uh, as a payer, right, of the bill or as a, as a biller, uh, you know, being on the receiving end? Right. Um, and, you know, are any of those frictions kind of warrant the uh, a move to modernizing or enhancing that uh, the bill pay ecosystem? Sue, I'll, I'll get back to you here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, absolutely. Like every other payment uh, that was established 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, there is absolutely room for improvement when you think about what's happened to technology. Uh, the, the biggest pain point. I think related to bill payment is when you push that button on your phone that says, I want this bill paid um, or when it, the recurring schedule uh, comes up to have the bill paid, uh, you assume that it's done, but it isn't. And so we are constrained with a kind of a legacy perspective about how money should be moving in real time. Uh, when I pay that bill, I wanna know that the recipient gets it now so that I'm absolved of my obligations and my payment has been timely. And I'm not gonna open online banking tomorrow and have a nasty surprise that in fact, uh, the, money, the money looks like it's gone, but the biller is calling me and saying, we never got your money. Um, and so, and potentially if it's for something like a credit card bill, you might be starting to face interest charges. So while it does create the perception for the consumer that they're in control. In fact, the legacy approach that it's built on isn't instantaneous and it isn't final. And so it, it, it could create a very disruptive situation for both the consumer and the biller because they'd rather have the money actually moving when the request is being made. So, so I think that absence of immediacy and finality to the payment uh, is a challenge that um, as soon as you move off a uh, happy path and perfect experience, you start to see the friction so that while on the whole, the system might be working well, 
um, around the margins, there is indeed quite a bit of friction. Yeah, and you know, we, we see that from, especially, you know, I talked about the move towards mobile, right? And it's, it's fair to assume that when consumer use mobile devices, they expect that immediacy that you're talking about, right? Uh, so I think, I think the, 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 that shift to digital is actually also contributing to the, the urgency that, 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 that we need. Uh, that's a great point because what, what, of course, what every financial institution wants to do is to create that sense of control and immediacy and deep relationship. And the mobile application is a vehicle for doing so. So of course they play back to you, your bill is paid. And so you actually think it's happened when in fact that money movement doesn't take place till later. Yeah, no, great. Mark, from, uh, from your point of view. Uh, friction points. Um, I mean, certainly agree with what Sue says. I think that's probably not the, some of the most challenging one because I know a lot of Canadians have now, again, when you pay your bill, it's going to get there in two days. So there is that upfront notification so of that, but that's certainly a, a, an issue. Uh, but friction points, I'd say, again, I always look at the different stakeholders. So from a Canadian point of view, the ability of what bills you can pay, it is sometimes dictated by the institution you're signed up with, with their particular biller list. So Again, some biller lists, there's a CCN number, there's only so many on that list and different lists. So the ability to pay more than just your traditional bill players at 12,000s. There are millions of businesses in Canada. So again, the, the ability to pay, give more options to pay, so the same utility. Um, current challenges, friction points is returns. Um, I'm not sure the experience when you paid a bill it does take a couple of days for the funds to get there. But when you wanna do that return on that bill, there are some friction points in that based on how the model set up right now, and I know solutions are coming out. And then I look at also from the merchant point of view, the, the friction points there um, being getting set up on a biller database. And again, sometimes there's advantages for larger billers, smaller bills, billers, not so much. So the ubiquitous about everybody being able to pay anyone. And, you know, just because I'm not a TELUS, a big company or so, a small Lev's landscaping or a smaller type of company should be able to receive payments. Um, and again, whether it's just different access or stuff. So these are some of the kind of, I'd say, friction points that I know are all being solved. But And the merchants, again, smaller merchants, the ability to get your money in a real time to help with your cash flow, all these aspects. So there are certainly friction points on both sides and um, capabilities that are being developed that uh, currently and in the future that will solve these things and uh, are being addressed by parties on this panel that I, I know of currently, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and Vipul, from a, uh, a large bank perspective, can you share your thoughts around friction? Yeah, absolutely. So, so let me add to some of the points that were made. So if you think about getting set up for bill payment, whether you are a Telus, a Rogers, or a small merchant, the banks, unfortunately, and the operations team has to go through the same process. Like imagine you're a TD business customer, They'll tell us like, hey, set me up as a bill payer. It's the same process that goes to an RBC, Scotia, and say, hey, can you set this person up as a biller? And think about the maintenance cost year over year, a simple example, and this applies to everyone, so I'm not calling out any particular entity, but CRA. Like me, I consider myself educated in the digital world, but I still like my hands shiver when I'm saying, hey, am I paying my pre-tax for, for next year, or am I paying today's tax, this year's tax, or last year's tax? It is a nightmare and God forbid you fat finger it and then you go through the process. The reconciliation, not the reconciliation, the dispute process can be anywhere minimum from 20 and upwards. Like I personally had a case where I had to go through 40 days without that being resolved. And so Im imagine the uncertainty. So that is where the merchant participant comes in. Think about the customer again. So from a customer perspective, if you are used a billing system before, fine, you're good, you just keep using your Capital One card and you're set. Your number changes. You are now deciding, is this the same Capital One card? What is the last number? And in my youth, I named it as my Costco Capital One card and forgot about it. And now I'm trying to figure out, okay, which Capital One card is it? So it's on both sides where there is uncertainty. And uh, people talked about the uncertainty of the payment itself as well. So I think th th that in my mind is some of the biggest frictions that we need to figure out as an industry how to actually solve for. Yeah, yeah. And Andrew, from, from your standpoint. 
Well, I, I hate to sound like a bit of a broken record, but I'm going to build on what many of my colleagues here have talked about. Uh, r really, two areas for me that stand out. One of the, is in, on the enrollment side, uh, and in, under, under the auspices of the rules, it's it's driven by what's called the lead FI process. And you know, as it's defined today, there are opportunities for improvement, specifically from an efficiency and effective perspective. You know, the lead lead FI only acts as the lead FI for purposes of receiving payments into the biller's account, but things like contracts, fees, reporting must all be negotiated as, as my colleagues have said, individually between billers and various financial institutions. And, and that in itself creates challenges, not only for the, the, the banks, but also for businesses, you know, setting aside those challenges with finding information on the products themselves, you know, the requirements for individual contracts, individual relationships really make the service only feasible for the largest and most motivated of billers. And as Mark said, we know today from a CCIN perspective that our penetration is about 1%. We, we know at our last study, more than a, bill, a million businesses in Canada with about 10,000 CCIN numbers in our database today. So we know penetration just isn't there. And what does that lead to? It leads to an inconsistent experience when attempting to pay bills digitally. I'll give you a perfect example. Recently, I had a, a motor vehicle infraction. It was going a little fast in, in the neighborhood and needed to pay a, a fine uh, here in Ottawa with no ability to pay it via online banking or frankly, through the city of Ottawa's website. I had to get on the phone and give my credit card number information uh, over the telephone to, to somebody on the other end, or write a check. And, uh, you know, in, 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 our, in our household, I don't even know where I could find a check these days. Uh, so, you know, that in itself is a challenge. And, and then I think the second piece for me, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit later, is the disparity between data and the payment. And as we look to RTR, and I know we'll talk about it later in the panel, but the lack of information, you know, even in an EDI context, there's some information there, but uh, the lack of data traveling with the payment that could invo involve invoicing information, I think that's a real uh, hindrance for us at the moment in terms of value added services that can be added. So those two elements for me. Can I add one thing, David? Sure. So, so Andrew, maybe that was part of the punishment going through that process. Uh, <laughs> but, but to uh, Andrew's point, I think one of the key things is you have so many billers that are in the system, others that are aren't, much more that aren't. But our analysis has shown that only the top 200 billers actually represent more than 95% of the volume. So imagine we have to do the same amount of work for the remaining 5% from a backend processing perspective. Like that is inefficiency at its best or worst. That, that is a great point, Vipul. So Manal, um, in the US, as you know, it's, it's the reverse picture, right? Of, of, of the bank bill pay versus the bill of direct model, right? Whereby bank bill pay accounts for 22% of the payment volumes and bill of direct accounts for 76% or so, right? Um, and it's also a slightly uh, different uh, payment uh, method mix, right? But um, are other issues raised uh, by our colleagues here, are those in line with what you're, you've seen in, in US or, or even in other markets? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say across the globe, I think bill pay is riddled with inefficiency. And, and there are some markets that are handling it a bit better than others as they modernize, I would say. Um, but a lot of similar pain, pain points of it, as I think about the U.S. market to what I'm hearing right, all of my colleagues speak to here. Um, I think uh, I'd say four key areas of the pain points um, in the U.S. market, that biller setup process is cumbersome, it's manual, not all billers are part of a directory to even enable a digital payment. So, and anything that's set up incorrectly in that first step leads to a check being cut by the FI that's traveling snail mail to the biller and the merchant. It's not good for anyone. Um, bill presentment is not ubiquitous. Um, we have um, some merchants, larger ones typically that are participating in e-bills. Um, but in many cases you have, you know, the experiences I'm looking at something perhaps through my FI experience, I've got a paper bill, I've got some in my email, very disjointed um, to consumers. Um, there's only one way to pay today out of the FI model in the U.S. market, which is through the bank account. 
Um, and, you know, I think uh, Sue may have mentioned this early on, consumers are looking for choice, they are looking for flex flexibility. And I think in, in many cases, merchants may be looking to offer, you know, different, different options. And that's one reason I would say the bill or direct model allows payment by card, for example, that, you know, perhaps allows someone to extend their payment, right, or, or to earn those loyalty points if they, if they choose to. Um, and then the last piece is around, you know, not having confirmation when you pay. And it's the peace of mind, it's, it's the immediate, immediacy of it that I think we've, we've been speaking to um, so far, but it's also just the peace of mind to the consumer that I, my payment got there. Um, and I think that's, you know, also something that, you know, creates a gap um, in the experience. And, and frankly, that is something that also has led to the rise of bill or direct, because if, if I'm paying on a bill or direct site, I do get that peace of mind. So I think, you know, bill, the bill or direct model in the U.S. market's grown because of some of these inefficiencies and it's solved for things like payment choice and the payment, you know, that immediacy of the payment getting there and, and the recognition of the payment. But I would say by and large, the research we see in the U.S. market is still that consumers would prefer to pay out of a single aggregated site one-stop shop to pay. Um, and also um, uh, they like the idea of doing that out of the safety and security of their financial institution. Uh, that, that is great. It's amazing to see, even though the, uh, the payment mix and the models are different, some of those issues are, uh, remains the same, right? Um, uh, yeah, so, so um, do you think Canadians want to see change? I mean, if we are if we're telling them via the mobile app or whatever that that you know things may be happening in real time even if it's not necessarily the case in the in the back end do you think they want to see the, any change in the customer experience either when making the payments or if you're a biller when when they're receiving uh, that payment so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you so I think the um, explosive growth of e-transfers and the way they're being used both by merchants and consumers um, for bill payments is evidence that there's probably uh, at least a generational issue here. Um, I, I think of my teenage daughter and the, the possibility for her to, for example, set up a pre-authorized debit and be asked to provide a void check. Well, she's never had a check in her life. And so I, I think, uh, and with the diversity of the statistics, David, that you were quoting early on about the ITA results, it shows that there is uh, uh, there are choices that are emerging because of the unmet needs, either on the consumer side or on the merchant side. I, I think one of the underlying issues and realities um, that Manal just touched on as well is both the merchant and the financial institution want to deepen the relationship with the customer through a direct interaction model. They want to understand the customer, they want to deliver value to the customer. And so I think a lot of these alternative ways that bill payments have evolved have been attempts by one side or the other to secure an opportunity to deepen that relationship uh, and then potentially sell them other things or simply enhance the value proposition. So to me, as I reflect on uh, where we need to go, it, it, we absolutely need to be respectful of demographic changes of unmet needs from merchants and deliver a diversity of choices um, because I, I think we, we know that CCIN uh, and the friction associated uh, on the margin of bill payments um, can be met in many other ways as we move to more modern platforms. So empowering either the merchant or the consumer, um, but most importantly, the person paying the bill, that, that they get the same value they get from existing, but can do it in multiple different ways because they don't want to think about how they pay, they just want to pay. Yeah, and, and um, you know, we have time today to get into the details, but the data also show, to your point earlier, Sue, uh, some differences, especially with regards to age groups, right? And preferences on, on how to pay. And that's, that's definitely an important component here. Yeah. Um, as, you know, some of the younger demographics are, are coming into the workforce and, and potentially changing their habits for what's likely going to be a very long time, right? Um, 
Yeah, one of the things I'd add too is we're seeing a lot of that driven by the merchant, right? Is they'll only accept getting paid in certain ways because it's going to lower their cost of payments, for example. And so when it's important billers in someone's life, like a landlord or like Canada Revenue Agency or someone that you interact with frequently, as they start to exert preferences for how they want to be paid, that has a very significant impact on the consumer side. Uh, and so I think we have seen higher frustration rates uh, on the merchant side, and that is driving some of the, the need for change. And hopefully payments modernization will help address some of that. That's great. Uh, Mark, to, to you now, the, um, going back to the question whether or not you think Canadians want to see a change in, in, in that experience. Um, I, I agree they do want to see a change, completely agree with the demographics and different people are looking at different changes at different rates because changing someone from myself to something new and changing my son or daughter to something new, they're already <laughs> using technologies in different ways. But I guess my approach is just how you give that change. And it's kind of a double-edged sword that people want change, but they don't want to change behaviors. So how do you currently, again, your stats show the vast majority of Canadians pay their bill through the financial institution. How do you keep them doing that, but give more functionality while they're doing that same thing? So uh, instead of me just logging in and paying my bill, and unfortunately right now it is a bit of a reactive, you have to log in and do stuff and more of the, uh, customer experience statistics go about how inconvenient it is for a client to deal with your service or what have you. So how much work are you making them do? How many steps? So, but that model, I guess that being the case, when they're logging in and they're paying their bill, allow them to do more functionality. So they're paying bills the current way. Well, that's where you plug in the real time movement of that fund will be moved instantaneously in the remittance. Or if there's an element of uh, a request or that request to pay or invoice presentment, provided the site where the client is used to experiencing their payments already. So again, it's the, the challenge is getting people to adopt new technologies or new processes. But when you implement new capabilities, which we can do with real-time rails, with bill presentment, with all these things that will help the end Canadian, don't make them change their behavior is what I'm saying. Add the functionality to what they're doing. And that's how you'll get the rapid adoption and the growth. On the opposite side, from a merchant point of view, in terms of do they want change? Well, absolutely, the, the access, the ability to receive funds in a real-time manner. Different merchants, based on their size and capability, we're gonna need their payment and the remittance in different ways. So we look at a real-time world. There are a lot of businesses that it'll be great to get my funds instantaneously, boom, boom, boom. Will I be able to handle my remittance, getting 100 remittances a day? They won't have the systems to do that. So they will still possibly need a hybrid of Real-time money with a, you know, a batch type of remittance file. So it depends on your particular needs, but all the capabilities are there. But again, kind of the key thing of, as we talk about what functionalities and what changes to bring, um, I think it's more importantly to be successful with changes, making sure the experience of the process is relatively the same and let technology do the work. That's kind of our approach with TELUS and our approach uh, as we see the successful way of getting new technologies implemented through Canadians that they're looking for. They just wouldn't, uh, just don't confuse them how to access it. This button used to do something. It does more now when I hit that button, but don't make me go to another button type of thing. Like keep it very consistent and just add the functionality. And that's what uh, smart people like on these panels and uh, joining this conference are, are solving. That's great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Vipul, slightly different questions for you. How strategic is bill pay to your organization? Um, do you currently view bill pay as a uh, competitive differentiator uh, or is it more like table stakes? It's a highly important. It's a crown jewel. So uh, various studies have shown that once customers start uh, paying bills with a financial institution, they are embedded into that financial institution. There is less attrition and so on and so forth. So it is definitely uh, of strategic importance. We don't look at it as making us a ton of money. In fact, it's a lot of cost um, based on everything that we've spoken, right? Uh, and I think one of the key areas that I would add based on the conversation is about, that's why we try very hard as to how do we solve that friction point? How do we make it frictionless for our customers to engage in bill payments, engage with the institution? Like a simple thing, if I talk about 
um, why it's so uh, the attrition decreases. Imagine me, a customer who is a TD customer, sets out about 10 billers, and then they want to move to, God forbid, RBC or Scotia and others. They would, they would go there and they may have to set this up again. I know services that are available that will try to transfer the billers, et cetera, but it is, a, it is not uh, without any issues. So that's why we feel that once we have bill payments working great, uh, the customers do stay with us. No, that's great. I think in many markets we're seeing, you know, if you think of the hallmark of the primary financial relationship, mm-hmm. bill pay is certainly one of those things along with automated you know, loan payments and direct deposit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you think about the consumer financial relationship, if you have, as a financial institution, if you have those three things, uh, uh, the likelihood of, of you being the financial institution for that, the primary financial institution for the customer is, is very high. Mm-hmm. Um, let's shift gear a little bit. So, you know, obviously payments modernization is happening in Canada, right? And uh, which uh, will not just enable real time or faster payments, right? But it will also enable the movement of data as, as we kind of briefly touched upon, right? Uh, alongside that payment, right? Today, if you, think, if you take ACH, uh, there's no data going alongside with the payment, right? It's just a, a kind of payment instruction, right? And, and obviously that, that uh, creates some, some issues there. So I'm gonna start with you, Andrew, on this one. How does Payment Canada plans to leverage the new RTR with its new capabilities and, and, and to enhance its role within the kind of the overall bill payment ecosystem? Yeah, I think there's really three areas. Uh, there are more than three, but three that I'll highlight here in terms of the intersection between the real-time rail and, and bill payments landscape. And, and the first has been talked about already today, but it's the speed. The speed at which funds are applied from a value dating perspective, uh, really reducing the friction and what I call the coping mechanisms that many Canadians and consumers have put in today, i.e. paying their bills X days in advance to make sure that they avoid or account for lags in processing time or potentially avoiding uh, late fees. I think the real-time nature of the, of the RTR really changes the game here. And I, I, I think about things like you know, hydro cutoff. My, if I don't get the bill paid by a certain time, and I'm um, and I'm waiting for payday or what have you, if I'm if, if the sequence is out of out of sync, I, I put myself into a bit of a, a, a bit of a jackpot. So I think that speed is is really important. Second, and I think it was Mark that had mentioned it uh, earlier about the concept of, of around request to pay. You know, for all types of all types of bills, whether that's recurring or one time, you know, it creates the environment to readily send the invoice data and the request for payment in one straightforward action. And so as you bring those two together, I think it starts to create all sorts of opportunities for FIs or fintechs or for, or for, for many for that matter to think about value add. And then the third piece for me is in in one-time payments. So I think about electricians, plumbers. I had a problem with my furnace in the winter. You know, didn't as always the way the furnace breaks in the middle of the winter and needed to get a fan replaced. Well, it was, they're not set up in in a bill payment space. They don't have a CCIN. So it was the same. It was on me on the telephone, giving my credit card number. I see something like RTR in a place for these sort of one-time payments that allows billers like that HVAC system, uh, HVAC company that now don't require them to be set up on something like a CCIN in advance to send me an email with the invoice with the request to pay and I can do that in one fail swoop. So to me, when we think about that new platform for innovation that is the RTR, I think bill payments really gonna be an area that can be exploited in that space. Thank you, Andrew. So Mark, with respects to the kind of the service you offer, um, you know, within the, the bill pay space, how does real time and, and data uh, help uh, in your role within the, the ecosystem as a biller? Uh, I'm, I see it more as just a biller. At the end of the day, I mean, I'm a very bit of a simplest because I agree payment is, I mean, data is a payment. I mean, or sorry, payment is nothing but a data flow. Data is a data flow, obviously. So. As you can move these, and again, within our solutions, again, the ability to move funds to billers of all sizes um, will be a benefit. 
Smaller builders, absolutely from a cash flow point of view that I was going to say. I think when it comes to the data aspect and sending that in, and again, eventually, I kind of look and I differentiate really when it comes to a biller, your traditional billers, your CCIN, 12,000 billers, 13,000 billers, really tell us this approach is again, a payment is a payment is a payment. And again, paying that HVAC person and having the ability through to empower clients to pay anyone. Uh, I just see the capabilities of the retail coming in will just, again, allow for that access movement. So, yes, from a cash receivable, I think it's going to help all that aspect. And in terms of how you look at how Canadians are going to be paid, you are, you are seeing through the gig economy, they're getting paid on a real-time basis as well. So it's not just one thing that's changing. The whole thing's changing. And I also look at it as well of what technologies that are not in place right now will be in place when these co things come live. 5G will be around then, a lot more IoT around that. So again, from an experience point of view of helping that, the same security and functionality can be around, you know, I wanna pay my hydro bill at that time, it recognizes my voice, it checks my database, it knows that where it, might, it checks into my bank, it knows where I wanna pay the bill. And that funds are moved before I finish my sentence. I mean, that's the world we're moving into. And I know it from TELUS and TELUS and others are bringing 5G to the world. So thinking about the solutions in our approach of how bill payment or payments in general, which is really the movement of data, secure movement of data and payment between different parties who are in agreement to um, share money and receive money. So we're kind of orchestrating things in a bit of different way. We see, you know, registration of a corporate into a payment mod, uh, vehicle being, how do you want to receive your payment and how do you want to receive your data? That data is either going to be, eventually it's going to be the ISO standard, which we're all building. We know, ways to do it. We need to find ways and technologies. And when I say we, I'm talking about our panel and, and all of us together to get these data to the these merchants that some are, again, like a tell us very sophisticated, have capabilities, but the vast majority out there are going to use these tools and that's how they're going to stay competitive. And that's how, again, the promise of the digital world we're all going into to level the playing fields for, for all. I think there's a, that's the kind of work that needs to be done behind the scenes, but it's all just enabling in different ways. And um, I guess I'm kind of rambling on here, so I'll pause, but I just, these new technologies I think are going to, don't think of the experience as right now, it's going to be a completely different experience. So when you think of solving solutions based on today's technologies, you think of the solutions that'll be in place when these things, it's gonna be completely different. How you engage your clients, the security will be built in and all the concerns and friction points that we're all talking about will be moot in many respects by some of the things that are being developed. Yeah, that's great. Um, Sue, so, so, you know, how does the, the payment modernization is going to, number one, improve the, the customer experience, right? But mm -hmm. so what is going the impact on the uh, financial institutions kind of back in operations? Uh, so, so when I, when I think about, uh, so I think a lot about billers. <laughs> Um, with all of this transformation. Um, and I, I can't remember which of my esteemed colleagues on the panel mentioned it, but um, this, this concept of data and the ability to handle all of this data, it is an explosion of information. Uh, it's, it's, it's welcome uh, because um, it's going to allow us to share information more efficiently. And, and the dream that you, that you have of having a, um, a, a small business person being able to get paid and have the story, the context flow through the financial institution into that small business's accounting package and then have a whole bunch of those accounting related processes streamlined because the data travels with the payment. Uh, that's a dream. And I think, uh, I think it was Mark that flagged, hang on a second here, not all merchants are gonna be able to handle all that data flowing through. And so when I think about uh, Central One and what we need to do and the changes to our back office, not only do we need to enable 200 credit unions to be able to receive those payments and send those payments and all that data, we also need to be mindful of the capacity of our merchants. Um, we are the second largest biller database in the country. And our challenge in a lot of cases is to ensure that we're building solutions in our back end that allow them to ingest at a pace that they can handle. 
because not everybody's going to have a slick fintech accounting package that can simply receive the data, file it brilliantly, and it become it, it then accelerates their automation of of their bookkeeping. Um, so so this is a journey, and at Central One we're thinking a lot about the smaller merchant and the smaller customer and the small financial institution who we support to help give them the the, the graduated service levels as they're able to take advantage of this. And at the same time, of course, managing existing services. So uh, ISO 20022 is not small. It is a very impactful change. Uh, and um, it, it's gonna take a while for us all to capitalize on the promise of it and be capable. Of, of handling it and taking advantage of it. That's great. Uh, Vipul, I, I saw you shaking your head. Do you agree with, with, with Sue? It's, it sounds like you do, uh, you know, both from a uh, customer experience and backend process. No, absolutely. I'll start off from the last statement that Sue made. Why is it going to take a long time? Because if I just pause for a bit on that thought and I say, I, I think of all this as money movement. So payments modernization is going to enable and facilitate money movement. The hope is that all these different systems that we have, like the e-transfers, bill payments, card payments, does a customer really care? Not really. Like I just want to buy the item that I have. I want to buy my home. I want to buy my groceries. And the payment is because I need to pay for it. I don't enjoy paying for anything, but how do we make that easy? And so that's what, and the reason it will take time is just take that one example. I think Mark had brought it up where uh, we have to create the value added services and we need to show value to the customer and only then it's going to work. A simple example, we all pointed out that bill pay, you'll get this ominous sign. Hey, it could be two to three days before your bill payment is made. So please may, make it ahead of time. That's a problem we know. So let's say real time does fix it. And in my mind, I tell my, or my customer, I tell them, Hey, real time, you click on the button and the payment is made. Guess what? If the receiver, the merchant on the other side, whether it's a Telus or a Rogers, does not change their process to process that receipt immediately and debit the customer's account, my customer is going to be charged the late fee. They're going to call the call center and the call center will have no record of the payment being made. <laughs> and that's, I think, emphasizing the point that you made. It is going to take everybody, the whole village, to actually come together, take advantages of the ISO 20022, the data format, uh, the real timeliness of the payment, and then the value add services that we create on top of that to the customer to actually make this work. It's going to be a slow process, but I think there is benefit to each and every stakeholder that I do strongly believe it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's great. Manal, you're, 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 in your role, you, you, you're seeing kind of the, the move to real-time payments uh, taking place in many markets, right? Uh, what can you tell our, our panelists here about, uh, for example, your experience within the ecosystem, what's taking place in the US with the move to, uh, to RTP? Um, uh, anything that can be learned from those other markets uh, that would be beneficial to, to our colleagues here as Canada rolls out uh, their new payments infrastructure? Right. So I would say by and large, in terms of the move to, to modernization, um, right, and especially for bill pay, um, it's, it's take some time. Um, so I, I definitely want to uh, play that back. I think from what we've seen all over the world, where it, it does take a village, it takes everyone in the ecosystem, certainly in markets and areas where you have a greater concentration, right, of billers and financial institutions, right, it may happen faster because you have fewer participants who need to adhere. But I would say in markets such as the US right now, where it's actually got tons of fragmentation, um, you know, we are saying that, seeing that it, it does take some time. So as an example, um, the Clearinghouse here launched the RTP network back in 2017. Um, tons of excitement, right? And BillPay was one of the use cases where we, you know, we, we know that there's been a, a, a very big uh, appetite and pent up demand. The early use cases that were actually deployed were a bit more simplistic, uh, more around um, 
P2P account to account payments, for example, uh, payroll disbursement use cases, um, you know, many institutions initially rendering to receive payments versus send just because of different obligations, right, that, that and implications of, of those roles may take. So that's kind of been a journey and more and more institutions are, are, are becoming enabled. And now we're seeing, right, the rise of uh, bill pay pilots, right? We're seeing it um, kind of in more um, uh, unique pockets um, hosted by the Clearinghouse. Um, for us as MasterCard, just as an example, we deployed Bill Pay Exchange, which is a real-time application. It's just a messaging application that leverages the ISO 20022 standard to enable the data exchange in real time. But it's a multi-rail application in the sense that it's allowing payments to flow either through, in the US, it happens to be the, the ACH system, um, through card or by RTP because of the fact that uh, not all billers, for example, will be ready or willing to receive all of those payments. So I think, you know, the more flexibility that's built in um, to uh, empower ecosystem participants, the better, because that will facilitate a, an easier transition and migration. Oh, that's great. So, you know, I heard um, efficiencies, right, and transparency. Uh, under efficiencies, you know, you can put real time and the data and then transparency to have kind of a, a, a clear picture here to this entire uh, payment process. Um, any closing closing thoughts uh, on how each of you are planning to harness um, the, the power of Canada's modernized payments infrastructure? Andrew, I'll start with you on this one. Sorry about that. I, I thought I'd get through the whole session without not being able to find the mute button, but uh, shucks, I, I didn't. Uh, you know, I think for me, from a closing sort of comments perspective, you know, speed and data with the payment are, for, for me, are keys to unlocking value in the bill payment space. You know, both of these will come with the introduction of RTR here in Canada. You know, we're seeing, uh, and the data shows, that bill payments bill paper payments making up less than half a percent and continuing to dwindle uh, for the, the vast number of years. And so it's clear to me that Canadians are embracing digital or electronic based payments. And from the Payments Canada perspective, it's important for us to update and refresh our systems and our rules to meet the needs of Canadian consumers and businesses in this important space. You know, lastly, when, when we look at our future roadmaps for our systems and our services, part of that bill payment review needs to include things like looking at opportunities to improve on our CCIN, things like broadening access to that service, enhancing data elements, you know, for example, the inclusion of biller account structure formats to allow for a more disciplined approach to validating customer account numbers when they set up an online bill as well as possibly extending the CCIN for account number or, or routing aliases and potentially the inclusion of QR codes, which we know are starting to pick up. You know, as I look to the future of payments, I think the bill payment space is going to be one that we're all going to be paying a lot of attention to and, and keeping an eye on. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, th thanks, Andrew. How about you, Mark? Um, Echo this thing just... Uh... Uh, a lot of exciting things coming up and in terms of the future. Some of the things we're candidly doing is a lot of what we spoke about. So, you know, uh, rethinking bill payments again, we should not just be isolated to what's on the CCN number, whatever, how do we expand that? So again, given the, um, the ability when you're going to pay your bill, now you have more than just 12,000, you can have up to a million, you know, the ability to pay anyone, uh, giving in your coming up with utilities to allow for some of the challenges that the future is going to hold. So how are you going to get those ISO standards or the ISO data to the end clients? Well, we have utilities where we get remittances to all billers, big and small, and that's the secret sauce to be able to handle all the billers. It's making sure the, the smallest of the smallest biller can get their money in remittance. And, um, but yeah, so a lot of exciting things coming down the pipe and, uh, it's going to be exciting. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. We, we are out of time, but um, Sue, one, um, one last comment from, from you in terms of a financial institution's point of view here. Yeah, so, so very quickly, I'll just say that I've, I haven't had a payments modernization conversation that didn't include reference to API, uh, and I need to get that in there. And so what <laughs> I want to say is, is 
such a huge part of what payments modernization is and real-time rail is, is around creating that sense of community. Um, you know, what Manal just said about what MasterCard is doing around how we build out partnerships and different engagement models to collaborate and deliver that value so that all that friction that we've been talking about goes away and all the opportunity can get seized on early. So uh, my parting comment would be, let's make sure that we embrace the digitization, that we embrace API, and that we create creative new uh, business models and partnerships to really take advantage of all of these capabilities and that we don't sit around and wait and watch what other countries are doing because we are, Bill Pay is a gem. It is an unbelievably powerful payment type to build a relationship. So this is an area where we should be knocking it out of the park and and not getting fussed about whether it's fi owned relationship or merchant owned relationship it's all about the customer that's great i think these are um perfect uh, uh ending comments uh, you know I, I would add moving from a transactional to a customer centric approach right to build payment uh, that is very important so i would like to thank uh, our panelists sue manal mark andrew vipul Thank you very much uh, for your valuable insights. Thank you to the Payments Canada team for uh, hosting us today. I hope you're having a great conference and take care, everyone. Bye.